Welcome. Thank you for joining our Best Practice Series webinar. I'm Becky Melody, your hostess for today's presentation. Jay Crowley, Vice President and Subject Matter Expert for the USDM UDI practice, will be presenting. The discussion today will cover introductions, webinar logistics, and our discussion topic, how to submit data to the Global Unique Device Identification Database. We're proud to have Jay Crowley joining the USDM team. Jay worked for the Food and Drug Administration for 27 years, most recently Senior Advisor for Patient Safety in the FDA's Center for Devices and Radiological Health. He developed the framework and authored key requirements for the FDA's unique device identification system. Jay also led the team responsible for the development and implementation of UDI requirements. With USDM Life Sciences, Jay focuses exclusively on providing business process, technology, and compliance solutions for the regulated life science industry. USDM is focused exclusively on the life science domain. We're the market leader in providing quality and regulatory IT compliance professional service solutions. We're headquartered in Santa Barbara, California, and we've delivered more than 1,000 successful projects with over 300 life science clients. We offer hands-on experience in assisting clients under regulatory distress, and we're the market leader for validation accelerator packs. Our various practices include global quality and auditing, IT and virtualization, life sciences cloud, GRC, the laboratory practice, which includes systems and equipment, ECM, ERP, PLM, enterprise quality management, manufacturing automation and equipment, clinical and drug safety, business intelligence, project management, and of course, the UDI track and trace practice. The content will be covered in approximately 30 minutes, and then we'll invite you to post questions for the team via the message board on the lower left of your screen. Or you can join us in discussion on LinkedIn and post any questions there. Of course, we're happy to address questions offline if they're of a confidential nature. Just shoot us a note at usdm at usdm.com. Thanks for taking the time to join us today, and with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Jay. Uh, great, Becky, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you for joining us. Um, there is a bit of material here, and I will try to get through it, um, as Becky suggested, in 30 minutes. Um, but uh, there is a lot to FDA's Global Unique Device Identification Database, or Good ID. Um, so we sort of sound out the, the acronym there. So if I fall into calling it that, please know that that's what I'm talking about. Um, so you can see the agenda here. I, I'm going to cover a number of these issues at a, at a very, very high level. Um, and I encourage you to um, uh, read the guidance document, uh, which FDA published uh, on September 24th of last year along with the final rule. Um, it's a draft guidance, actually, and it goes into a, a lot of detail about how the database works, uh, the mental model of the database, how accounts are created, how records are created, um, a lot of information. Um, FDA has stated that it's coming out with a final guidance very soon, um, but note that the database exists. Um, it, it's built. It's operational. Um, so you're not going to see a lot of changes to the way the database operates. The guidance uh, will probably provide some more clarity around certain aspects of the database or, or, or more formal definitions for some of the attributes. Um, but uh, but but the, it is what it is, and so the guidance, even the draft guidance, is, is really a very good starting point. Um, FDA has also recently pulled two appendices out of the guidance document or out of the draft guidance document, and, and they have posted those um, separately. They will continue to exist as, as separate standalone documents and not part of the guidance anymore. Um, the, the first one, and probably the most important one for folks, is what used to be Appendix B. Um, and it describes each of the data attributes um, that are part of the database, uh, definition, list of values, and a number of other attributes associated with 
each of those attributes or elements. Um, so that exists now. Um, and there have been some slight changes uh, to a couple of the elements. Um, so I, again, I would encourage you, if you're preparing um, your database submissions, that you be sure to get that up-to-date version of what was Appendix B, the list of, of attributes uh, off of FDA's uh, website. Um, the other thing that they did, and, and it's, it's, it's not particularly um, germane to today's conversation, but just to let you know, um, that they did pull out um, what was the appendix that described each of the issuing agencies and how uh, UDI is presented. So for GS1 and HIBIC and ICCBBA, um, they removed, um, uh, the, they took out of the guidance document how the, the UDI is presented and again uh, made that into a standalone document. Uh, so with that, let's let's move through. I am on slide six. Hopefully, everyone can is is online and can see this. Um, if you can't, we can surely get you a copy of the presentation. But I am on slide six, um, and and I, it, this describes the two work streams that we typically talk about when, when we talk to clients about UDI. Uh, the first work stream really is about the assignment and and placing of UDIs on the label of a device and on higher levels of packaging. And we've covered uh, uh, many of these issues in previous webinars, so I encourage you, uh, if, if you haven't had a chance to take a look at some of our previous webinars, uh, to go ahead and do that. And that describes work stream number one. Um, work stream number two is what we're going to focus on here today, uh, which is really around uh, the, all the activities that are required for submission of data to, again, uh, the global UDI database or, or, or good ID. And, and that's the part that we're going to talk about today. And, and I will tell you, um, and I think this is, this is fairly true across the board, that Workstream 1, while, while it may have a number of moving parts and pieces to it, uh, Workstream number 2 really is the more complicated aspect of, of UDI compliance. And it's difficult for a number of reasons. Um, and I think the primary one is that Prior to the creation of, of, of this data set and the need to submit data, uh, manufacturers often haven't had all of the data elements together in one place. Um, and so what we find often is the data um, doesn't necessarily exist as a discrete data element in, in, a, in a data system. Um, it likely it may be on a label. It may be a part of an Excel spreadsheet. So there's a whole host of activities that need to take place in order to simply find where all the data is. Um, so And then collecting it, normalizing it, and validating it, a whole set of activities there um, that, that can be quite time consuming. Uh, moving on to slide seven. Um, and if you've seen any of my previous presentations, you, you've seen this slide before. It's a very high-level overview uh, of, of the good ID. Um, essentially, there are a couple of points here that I want to make. Uh, first of all, um, hopefully everyone is aware that UDI, uh, the, the entire UDI is, is, a, is a device identifier and a production identifier, um, and that the database does not collect production identifiers. So there's no lot numbers or serial numbers that are submitted to the database. But for each device identifier or static portion of the UDI, uh, there is the set of data that we'll talk more about that needs to be submitted to the database. Um, importantly, there are, are two ways, or we'll call it two ways, uh, that data can be submitted to the database. There's a, a web-based user interface, um, much like you might go on to Amazon. Uh, you have a username and password, and you, you log on to the system. And depending on your role, which we'll talk more about in a moment, um, you can do various activities, either managing the account or managing uh, submission of device identifier records to the database. Um, and it's, it, it provides a lot of functionality. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how it operates. Again, there's a lot of information in the, in the draft guidance that I'm sure it will look very similar in the final guidance about how all of that works, how, how the user interface, uh, the web-based user interface works. Um, and it's, it's great if you've got uh, a couple records, maybe even a couple hundred records. Uh, the web-based user interface works very well. If you're into thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of SKUs or, or records that need to be submitted, um, obviously that's going to be a difficult thing to do one at a time. And so uh, most manufacturers are looking towards an automated solution uh, which, would, which would utilize uh, the standard that FDA has adopted for submission of data, uh, which is the Health Level 7 
structured product labeling. Uh, you can see it listed there as HL7SPL. Um, it's a standard that FDA uses for the submission of various kinds of, of registration activities. Um, if you're also a pharmaceutical manufacturer, um, you've been doing drug registration and listing using a version of SPL for some time, and a number of other centers are also taking advantage of this standard as CDRH has done for UDI submissions. Um, and there is also on FDA's website an implementation guide uh, which describes the creation of this specific XML which is submitted through FDA's electronic submission gateway and then gets loaded into the database. Again, there's a lot of information in the implementation guide if you're interested in understanding how that works. If you're not interested in doing either of those, um, uh, USDM has a number of partners uh, that can provide a, a solution, uh, an automated solution for you, uh, typically built on an existing platform. So if, you're, if you have a particular ERP or PLM system, um, there are many of the vendors uh, have or have their partners have created uh, solutions that, that exist on top of those systems that allow you to organize and then submit the data electronically. It transforms it into an SPL standard into the X, SPL XML and then submits it to the database. So if you're not, if you're looking for some of those, we're, you know, we're glad to help you uh, understand the, the various issues and, and, and what's going on there. Um, and again, all that data gets submitted then to FDA's database. Um, you can see there's a box there that talks about business rules. Um, there are a number of business rules, some of which are implicit in the elements itself, some of which are run, and uh, I'll touch on those very, very briefly, but again, uh, all of that is, is described in, in the guidance and in what was Appendix B in some detail. And then the data gets ultimately uh, published uh, to the web, to, to the database, and is available or will be available at some point uh, to the public. Uh, know that for now, FDA has shut off uh, the public user interface um, so that even if data is submitted, uh, no one can see it yet. Um, and that's the sort of a, a, just to make sure that everything is working smoothly as manufacturers are beginning to populate the database, FDA wanted to be sure that in fact the records were moving through in a correct and validated way and were getting published uh, correctly. So some point here, I'm guessing in the not too distant future that, that public user interface will be turned on, um, but for now it is not. Um, if you are submitting uh, to the database, you can see your own records. Um, so not a concern there, but you can't see anyone else's. Uh, moving on to slide eight, um, again, this is a, a list of, of the attributes that are described in, in much more detail in what was Appendix B. Um, it's, it's breaking down each of the elements into their discrete attributes. So you can see there that, um, for example, it's not just collecting uh, the primary device identifier number, but first you have to tell the system which issuing agency it's coming from, then you give it the device identifier number. So it's really breaking down each of these elements into their discrete attributes. Um, obviously, hopefully it's obvious, not each of these attributes will be required for each, um, each record. Um, many of these are conditional on, on the particular type of product that it is. Um, and, and just will depend on, on, on what the attributes of that particular device identifier record are. Um, I do want to draw your attention, um, and uh, it's a little hard to find in this list, uh, but to let you know that uh, one of the elements that changed uh, was the way in which MRI safety uh, information is presented. Again, the UDI rule does not require that manufacturers label their products as being MRI safe or unsafe. Uh, but if you do label your products with one of those uh, ASTM-approved MRI statements, um, then you need to reflect that in the database. It used to be a two-part question, um, and I think it's actually listed there as such. Um, I will need to update the slide. Um, uh, it, it used to ask, is the device labeled for MRI safety? And if the answer was yes, then you provided either the safe, unsafe, or conditional as an answer. Um, it now has changed, and now there are essentially four uh, elements that you can pick from. You either indicate that the device is MRI safe, unsafe, conditional, or is not labeled with MRI safety information. So some slight differences, um, and that one in particular, in the way that the information is being presented. Uh, hopefully we won't see any more changes to, to the data set uh, before the, our compliance date coming up here in September of this year, or our first compliance date. 
Um, as I mentioned, there are a, a number of activities that, that need to go on in order to create this data set that then gets validated and submitted to, to FDA, or at least to the, to the good ID. Um, and identifying uh, the data is often the first challenge. Where does it exist? Who owns it? What format is it in? What are, what are the SOPs around changes to it? Um, so all of that work needs to be done up front. And as I mentioned before, uh, much of the data may not exist as a discrete data element at this point and will likely not exist uh, in, in, an, in some other system or as a discrete in electronic format, um, but will have to be gathered and transformed into the appropriate format uh, that the database is, is expecting to see. Um, so you can see there in step two, obviously the collection normalization and validation of the data, making sure that in fact what it gets transformed into or normalized into is in fact the correct correctly represents what the source data was. Um, and then in my next slide, I'll show you that there's, as we've talked about, a number of different ways in which the data can be submitted to the database. Moving on to slide 10, um, as I mentioned, in the, the top uh, arc here is, is the uh, Good ID web interface. Um, if you are a manufacturer of, a, of at least one class three product, uh, you can obtain uh, both a production and pre-production account. Um, so you can go into the system, see how it operates, um, submit data either actually or, or just play around with a little bit, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, but you have to have at least one class three product uh, in order to, to obtain an account at this point. FDA did this to make resources available to those manufacturers of class three products so that they had sufficient resources available as manufacturers of those products were beginning to submit data. Um, I do expect that sometime probably closer to September of this year, uh, they will open up the database to manufacturers that do not have a class three product. Uh, note that if you have at least one class three product, the database doesn't limit what you can submit. You just have to have at least one class three product, and we'll talk more about this in a moment, in order to obtain an account. Um, you can see there that then there are three other arcs that lead into the database. Uh, the bottom one uh, is, is really uh, where a manufacturer has chosen to create their own SPL solution and is submitting directly. Um, the other two represent various, um, various ways in which um, some of our partners have decided uh, to, to operate, and you can either have a hosted or outsourced way in which uh, the data is converted into an SPL and then submitted to the, to the database. Pros and cons to all the approaches, um, and again, we're, we're happy to work uh, with you to, to make a decision about which one is best for you. Um, there is, uh, I have moved on to slide 11. Um, there are a number of resources that are available. Uh, we've talked about some of them that are available already on USDM's website. Uh, all of the information that FDA publishes about the UDI program itself is available on FDA's UDI website. You can see the short uh, URL there. And then finally, information about the database itself, guidance documents, implementation guides, uh, those kinds of things are made available at that uh, link you can see at the bottom of the page. Um, so we're on slide 12 now. Um, and as I mentioned, the first thing that uh, a manufacturer needs to do, regardless of which uh, way in which you decide to submit data, so even if you have a third party that's going to submit the data for you, you, the device manufacturer, need to create an account. Um, so that's the first step, regardless of, of, of which path you take. Um, you go to FDA's website, to their help desk, uh, which is a Salesforce-based application, and uh, you can see that there's a link that will, where, in which you can ask for an account. Um, they will send you back a form that you fill out with information. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about DUNS numbers, but I do want to draw your attention to this issue. Uh, so DUNS, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, uh, assign identifiers uh, to physical and virtual organizations. Uh, your organization has a series of DUNS numbers now, um, and FDA is using DUNS numbers as a way to both identify organizations and a way to identify individual uh, labelers uh, within uh, the UDI database. Um, again, if you are also a pharmaceutical manufacturer, uh, you will note that uh, FDA has been using DUNS numbers in, in that space uh, for a while. 
Um, and actually, the agency is moving, FDA as a whole is moving towards the use of DUNS numbers uh, to identify facilities and firms. So I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, or, or don't through your, your, your accounting part of your organization where this usually resides, um, you either find or reach out to, to Dun & Bradstreet and obtain uh, a, a list. You can get it online as well. Um, get a list of your DUNS numbers, understand them, make sure that they are accurate. Um, uh, Dun's, Dun & Bradstreet will work with you uh, if you need to make some changes, but make sure you understand and, and have a solid foundation of a DUNS. It's a tree. Right, moves up towards a corporate hierarchy. Uh, make sure that you understand that and that that is something that you can then use not only for, for good ID submissions, but something that you're going to end up using for other FDA-related activities as well moving forward. Um, again, there are some instructions uh, on creating an account. And if you, if you do go down this path, I encourage you uh, to do it soon. If you have a, a Class 3 product, uh, get an account so that you can get into the system and see what's going on. Um, if you are not submitting data, instead you're using a third party, uh, it's through this mechanism that you would identify the appropriate third party uh, that can submit data for you. So this, this account process has a number of, or account creation process has a number of, of purposes to it. Um, moving on to slide 13, um, a little bit more information on the organization account. Um, you, you have to have at least uh, you have to have a labeler DUNS number uh, in order to create an account. So typically it would be a corporate number uh, that would be assigned to that one organization. Uh, its only purpose is to identify that organization, so uh, you don't need to get too wrapped up about it. Um, and as an organization, you may choose to have one account, um, and we'll talk more about this in a moment with multiple segments. Or you can, if you have multiple operating divisions, each operating division cr can create their own account as well. So there's a tremendous amount of flexibility built into the way that the organizations can be created. Again, you can have sort of one parent and with many, with many children, or you can decide that each of the children, quote unquote, uh, are their own organizational account. So there's there's a number of different ways to do that. Pros and cons to both approaches. Uh, again, uh, the guidance document describes uh, how this works, and so it's really up to you to decide uh, which way you want to go. FDA uh, doesn't have an opinion. Um, moving on to slide 14, uh, uh, taking this a bit further, um, we can see here that in, in this uh, option, um, there's one account, one parent account, and there's a number of children which are the labeler done. So um, there's two types of DUNS numbers that we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the account DUNS, right, the organizational DUNS. So I have my parent DUNS number, and that's what I've created my account with. But the way that each device identifier record is identified is through uh, the labeler DUNS. So each, uh, the name and address that's on the label of each product should match your DUNS number that is submitted as part of the organizational structure here. Uh, so you can see in this case, um, ooh, that slide should not say 1, 1, and 1, but should say 1, 2, and 3. Apologies. Um, something happened in the transformation of the slide. Uh, so again, there's one organizational DUNS number, and there should be three distinct uh, labeler DUNS numbers that are then part of that one organization. Um, in contrast, um, oh, so here are the pros and cons that I've, I've talked about as well. Um, in contrast, we can see that uh, a manufacturer could choose to do it differently and create three different organizations, each with uh, one or more of their own labeler DUNS. Um, and this next slide, again, will talk more about the pros and cons. Um, again, there's more flexibility in this. Uh, but it does require coordination across the organization uh, to make sure that everyone knows what each other is doing. Um, moving on to slide 18, um, there's, there are two roles uh, within uh, the database. Um, and this was a security issue, a security concern. Um, so there's the coordinator role and the labeler data entry role. So the coordinator, as the name implies, um, is responsible for managing the account and the labeler, labeler data entry, or LDE, is the person who actually would create and submit the, the DI records. Um, so two different roles, two different responsibilities. They can be the same person. They would have two different logons, 
um, logins, logons. Um, but again, they're two different roles. Coordinator manages the account and the LDEs, and the LDE is the one who actually creates the record. Um, and there are also options here uh, for how uh, coordinators are uh, and how accounts are managed from a coordinator perspective. Uh, you can have one coordinator um, that then manages uh, everything within that organization. Uh, obviously, the pros and cons to that approach. Or you could have multiple coordinators uh, that then manage uh, different parts of the organization. Uh, so again, a lot of flexibility in terms of how an organization wants to manage uh, the, the LDEs, manage the account uh, within it. Uh, moving on to slide 21. Um, so that's all the managing the account, managing the people who are going to submit the data uh, into the database. Uh, finally, we get to the point of submitting data, and it's the labeler data entry or LDEs who will actually be the ones who submit the data. They're the only ones who can create, or only people that are in this role uh, can create uh, a record, submit a record to the database. Uh, moving on to slide 22, um, uh, the first thing, of course, that somebody needs to do is to create a new DI record. Uh, a lot of the data fields, and I, and I encourage you, even if you're not going to submit data uh, through the web interface, uh, and you are a manufacturer of at least one Class 3 product, I really encourage you to at least get a pre-production account so that you can go in and see how the database operates. You, you don't have to submit any data. You can just go in there and you can play with it, understand the constraints that each of the data fields have, uh, what the input controls are, what the business rules are, where there's controlled vocabularies, what those controlled vocabularies look like. Uh, so it, it really, there's a, a lot of benefit, I think, to actually just getting in there and I wish I had a better verb, but playing uh, with the data set and seeing how it operates. Um, when you go on, you also see that some of the elements have red asterisks. Those are, as often, uh, required fields, uh, and they typically have very uh, sensitive and strict input and business rules associated with them as well. Uh, moving on to slide 23. Um, this is a, a, a very important concept, um, and, and it goes back to what I was talking about in, in terms of, of, of really seeing how the database works. Uh, but if you are in the production version of the database, um, a record has essentially three states. Um, you, so you've created a record, and you can save it as a draft. Um, it doesn't pass any business rules. No one else can see it but the person who creates it. It just sits there as a draft. And so you can go in there, uh, enter some data. Okay, now I'm not sure. I need to go get some other data, or I'm not sure how to answer this save it. You can do this forever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, after six months uh, of not being used, the draft gets purged. But otherwise, a record can sit in the draft state uh, in, in, for as long as you want, and you can edit it and re-edit it until the cows come home. Um, once you are gotten to the point where you're, you have a complete record, uh, you will review the record, which will run all the business rules. And if you pass all the business rules, you can then submit the record. Um, and, once, and, and a submitted record has one of two states. It's either published or unpublished. And it, they are, as the name implies, uh, either available, published to the public website, or they're not. So an unpublished record is one that is yet to be published. You have to put in a publication date, but you can put a publication date uh, uh, tomorrow or a decade in the future. Uh, and I would encourage you, uh, to put in a future publication date uh, to make sure that you've got all the data correct. But you can, and you can then edit that unpublished record for as long as you want. You can continue until it publishes to edit that unpublished record. Um, at any point in that process, you can change your mind, and you can then, as it says there, uh, deactivate the record. Any point prior to publishing it, you can deactivate the record um, and so you know, it, it just sits there uh, with only you being able to view it or one of the other LDEs. Note that once a record does get submitted, um, either, well, let's just talk about into an unpublished state, then any LDE with access to that labeler DUNS can also review the record. So it's a good way of actually creating uh, an SOP around data validation. And we're happy to talk about that more as well. 
Um, when the publication date does come, or if you publish it with a publication date of today, then the record moves into a published state. And at that point, the record is publicly available. And when that happens, um, then, then certain things cannot be changed. Um, and I'm hoping the next slide, um, I'm going to pop up to a slide here, um, and then I'm going to come back. Um, so, um, so once it's published, um, the grace period starts, and you have seven days uh, after the publication date in which you can change anything in the record except for the publication date. So for seven days, you can change anything, any of the elements, any of the attributes except the publication date for seven days. After the seven days, after the grace period expires, there's, a, there's a, uh, a whole set of rules around what can happen to each attribute. And again, this is reflected uh, in what was Appendix B. Um, some things can be changed. Uh, some elements can be added to but not removed. Um, and there are uh, certain elements, uh, what we call core elements, that cannot be changed. Uh, what we call new DI triggers. So if you try to change it, it says, no, this is in fact a new device and you have to create a new record. So you'll see that there are certain elements, uh, like the name of the product, uh, that can't change. If you try to change the name of the product, the database is telling you, well, that's actually a new record and you have to assign a new DI to it. Um, I want to back up then, sorry, and, and come back to some other aspects here of, of, of the of of editing. Um, I think I've covered most of these. Um, again, you can edit a draft DI record, um, and you can do this over and over again. Uh, you can review it to see if it passes all, all the applicable business rules, and you can still save it as a draft, and you can delete it at any time. So again, the draft is your sandbox to play in uh, until you're ready to submit the record. Um, the review function, as I mentioned, is running against all of the business rules. Uh, to determine whether or not it, it, it's met the business rules that are implicit in it. Again, some of the business rules are input requirements, input functions. It won't let you, for example, if you're trying to enter a, a GTIN as your device identifier, it's going to require that there's 14 digits there. Uh, that's so it's an input requirement as opposed to a validation rule, which is going to run against other uh, aspects of the database or, or other data sets that FDA is using. Um, moving on to slide 26. Um, again, you can, uh, we've talked about uh, submitted records uh, and editing them and what can be edited and all of this. Again, in the unpublished state, you can change anything uh, at any time, uh, but when it moves into a published state, that's when the grace period starts. Um, again, we've talked about editing unpublished records. Uh, you can do that, so you can go in publish, uh, submit the record with, with a future publication date, and it will sit there no one else can see it except the LDEs that are associated with that, uh, that labeler DUNS, uh, and it will sit there uh, without anyone else seeing it until the publication date uh, arrives. We've talked about this slide, um, and uh, I mentioned already a number of the elements. There's about a dozen uh, of the, uh, the attributes that are what are called new DI triggers. You can see some of them are listed there. Um, but again, the, the data, the, the, what was Appendix B describes all of these uh, in, in much more detail, so I encourage you to take a look at those. And with that, it um, looks like there's some questions, Becky, so I'd like to throw it back to you and, and uh, we'll try to get through that in about a half hour so we give ourselves some time for some questions. Tremendous. Thank you so much, Jay. Appreciate the good information there. And yes, we do have some questions coming up. Uh, before we get to those, and while the rest of you are typing in your questions, would like to just share a little bit about USDM. For those of you who aren't as familiar, I do see several uh, very familiar names there. Thanks again, team, for joining us. Um, would like to let you know that USDM has three different delivery options. First is our projects team, uh, one of which is led by Jay, of course, and that would be the UDI space. But our projects team supports your start to finish compliance initiatives, each one uh, led by SME practice directors or SME project managers, and utilizing the USDM team with various skill sets. So based on your client preference, we can be flexible with our availability to work on-site, to work remotely. Um, our team would report up through our own team members connecting with your senior project team leaders, so uh, whichever works for you best. Um, the second uh, 
approach would be our staff augmentation, and so that supports your internally managed projects. So we have solid team members offering various skills and experience. Again, if you need a tech writer, we're not going to offer a project manager. If you need uh, someone that's a senior CSV person, we can tailor our skills to exactly your needs so they would report in through the people on your site, on your team. Uh, the third approach is a USD, uh, USDM on demand, and that's a blended on-site, onshore, offshore model, and it's for managed services, uh, mostly development and support, and validation testing. That approach incorporates cost uh, the cost savings of offshoring while reducing the risk, ensuring a higher success level than traditional offshoring. And with that, let's move quickly into the questions. Our first one uh, will take us from Catherine. Uh, Catherine says that uh, they don't have a Class 3 device approved yet. They're in PMA process, anticipate approval after the September deadline. Uh, one, they're assuming that the proposed labeling in the PMA will need to include UDI. Two, uh, when can we or should we submit to the good ID? And can we do it before approval to be ready as soon as it's approved, or must we wait until approval before starting to work on the good ID, as it's the first device for us in the U.S. market? Uh, the risk to extend the time between the PMA approval and commercialization correct? Uh, let me know, Jay, if you need me to repeat any of that. Good questions, Catherine. Thank you for uh, putting that together so well worded. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, there's a couple of moving parts and pieces there. Um, at this point, um, uh, of course, as I mentioned, um, one needs to have a, an, an approved PMA in order to get an account. And hopefully this is all going to open up here sometime in the near future. Um, you, you, and assuming it does, so assuming you have an account, you can go in and start to create the record for this product or records for this product. Um, but one of the things that one of the, the business rules that is run um, is against uh, a PMA number, so you need a you need a valid uh, PMA number. You need a product that's that's approved in this case uh, in order to um, s actually submit the record. So um, you actually need to have that piece of information and a, a, a listing number, by the way, as well, um, in order or before the record can actually be published. But you could assuming you have access to the database, actually create the record uh, with all the information except for that information, and then once you have that information, add that and then publish it. Very good, very good, thank you. Uh, Catherine, to your second question, um, we will have a recorded session, uh, recording of this presentation available on our website later today. And yes, there are uh, two or three sessions previously recorded by Jay on the UDI topic that you can find on our website as well. Um, if, if you go to our website and just click on webinars, there's a list of about 60 different sessions across the various practice areas, all full of information that can address uh, questions and pain points for you and hopefully uh, answer some additional questions. Um, and just shoot me an email if you have any difficulty uh, locating them. I'm happy to help. Um, hi, Paul. Uh, thanks for your question. Um, Paul is asking uh, for smaller companies that are collecting and submitting the information manually, what verification or validation will the FDA be looking for? Will auditors be reviewing this? Um, at this point, uh, there's no um, there's no ex review per se um, by auditors or inspectors. Uh, FDA does have a team of data quality uh, experts um, who are really looking at the data not so much for how you've answered it, uh, but really to understand whether or not the instructions are clear. Uh, whether the data is coming in a consistent way across, you know, across the database. Um, so people are, are looking at it, but more to make sure that, that the database is operating correctly, that information instructions are clear, and those kinds of things. Um, I, at first, I, I thought maybe this was enter, you know, heading into more of a business rules kind of discussion. Um, and again, most of that is, is laid out in, in the guidance document and uh, is described in what was Appendix B. Uh, but beyond that, there aren't any real data 
validation activities that go be beyond what the database is doing inherently, either through input control or through business rules. Thank you, Jay. Next question is from Susie. Uh, what is the difference between primary DI number and unit of use DI number? Um, it's a great question. And again, I, I encourage everyone to, to take a look at the guidance, um, draft guidance that explains all this. There's a couple of different device identifiers or DIs. Uh, there's the primary DI, which is, is the is that, that part of the UDI. So we've got the device identifier and production identifier. So the primary DI is the, is, is the, is the pri no pun intended, uh, primary identifier of the record of this particular DI record. Um, there's a number of other device identifiers that can be associated with the record. You have to have at least the primary DI. Uh, if the base package, uh, that which this record describes, um, contains more than one device, so it's a box of 10 bandages, for example, um, that, that is the base record. Uh, then uh, a unit of use identifier uh, is, is assigned to that individual bandage. It's, it's a virtual identifier. It's not marked. It doesn't have to be marked. Uh, but it's a virtual assignment in order for everyone else to be able to talk about that one bandage. Uh, this really came out of, of work that was going on in the pharma space um, when you would try to talk about one pill and you had an NDC assigned to a box of 500, or a bottle of 500 pills, excuse me. Um, so there's a unit of use device identifier, uh, which is required whenever the base package contains more than one. Uh, you'll see there's a number of other DIs as well. There can be a secondary DI. so. Um, if you're using two issuing agencies or you're transitioning from one to the other, or you want to maintain a, a NDC or NICRIC code on the product until, uh, you know, until such time as it's not allowed, uh, you, can, you can assign a secondary DI. And then there's also higher levels of packaging that have their own DIs as well. Thank you, Jay. Next question is from Samin. If a device or product is loaded into the good ID and later becomes obsolete or discontinued, no longer manufactured, how would the database be updated to reflect the removal of this product? Or would it need to remain since there may be customers impacted by the older device? Great question, and, and thank you for raising it. Um, the answer is a sort of both. <laughs> Um, we talked about publication and publication date. Uh, I didn't cover, but the database also has a concept uh, of discontinuous, discontinuing a product. Um, so at some point in the future, if the product is no longer commercially distributed, uh, you would put a commercial distribution end date into uh, the database. Uh, the data would still reside. It would still exist in the database. Uh, but a different flag would be set which says, in essence, uh, this product is no longer available for commercial distribution. You can't purchase the product. It may still be in the supply chain. Somebody may still have it, what have you. Uh, but it does, it does, you are required when you stop uh, distributing, stop putting a product in commercial distribution for whatever reason, uh, that you then indicate that, that date of when, that's, when that has happened or when that's going to happen uh, in the database as well. Thank you, Jay. There's a follow-on question from Samin as well. Um, so also, if a product will become obsolete prior to the required uh, respective UDI compliancy dates, would the product need to be included? For example, the device is a class two that will be discontinued by 2016. Would it need to be loaded within Good ID? It doesn't have to be loaded, but it can be loaded. Um, so you may, for other reasons, want to have it in there uh, from a completeness perspective, or maybe it's got a you know a long life or a long long supply chain life. Um, so you can go in and 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 enter a, a, a distribution date of today and an end distribution date of today. So you can do that and just, just so that the record exists in the database. But you don't have to. Thank you. Okay, next question is from John. Nice to see you on the uh, call, John. Uh, can the eSubmitter software be used to upload data into the Good ID through the ESG gateway? 
Um, no, uh, FDA decided not to build uh, an e-submitter kind of tool um, for, as, as, as it does for other systems, uh, for the good ID because uh, there's a, it, it's not a, there's a, often a many-to-many -many relationship that exists, um, and so it was not going to be something that was going to be easy to do. So uh, in lieu of an e-submitter kind of tool, uh, that's where the web interface came from. Um, so there's the web interface, uh, there's the SPL submission. Um, there are some of our partners do have uh, spreadsheet upload uh, tools. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, uh, there, are, uh, there are folks who have tools available uh, that we can help you, you know, can point you to uh, if that's something that you're looking for. And uh, Renee's question is in the same space, asking if USDM has been successful in submitted SPL records through ESG. Um, well, we're not a software provider. Uh, our partners have been. <laughs> a number of our partners have been. So yes, it is. There are uh, folks who have submitted um, and, and, and have submitted records successfully. Um, and again, we're happy to point you to one of our partners or have that conversation about which one might be the best fit for you. Absolutely. Okay, next question is from Pamela. Assuming data is complete, how long does it take to upload an individual file to the good ID? Um, well, I'm so I'm not sure whether that's an SPL question or a web interface question, so I'll just answer it both ways. So if you're, if you're on the web interface and you're entering the record, um, if the question is how long does it take to enter the data, um, you know, it's kind of, you know, assuming you have all the data available, you know, it's a, it's a 10, 15 minute kind of, of thing to go into each record and enter the data. Um, if you became proficient at it, you could probably do it quicker than that, but that's probably a reasonable average. Um, and then you can submit, publish the data uh, immediately if you want or with a future publication date. Um, if the question is around uh, SPL submission, um, that happens, uh, that's an overnight run that happens. Um, so the, the records go through a series of steps. They have to get through uh, the ESG. Um, there's a series of acknowledgments uh, that come back, a series of three acknowledgments that, that, that look at, at looking at how that record gets submitted. Um, but that all happens, and it, it happens nightly. So if you submit a record, with a publication date of tomorrow when you submit it today. Tonight it runs, you know, after midnight tonight or whatever time it runs. Uh, it runs and looks for all the records with the publication date of tomorrow, and then it runs it, it just runs through the night and, and, and runs through all those and then pushes them out to the database. Very that good. wasn't Thank your question at all. Please feel free to ask a follow-up <laughs> question. <laughs> yeah, ad hoc here. Add something for me. Um, okay, so next question is from John. Um, as a strictly class two device manufacturer, is there anything I should do right now? And John, I'll start with that. Um, I think you should reach out to USDM and ask us specifically to get involved with your strategic planning uh, for your class two compliance. <laughs> we do have uh, some larger entities. Actually, it depends on the size of uh, your entity and what the undertaking is going to look like. And Jay, I'll ask that you add anything to that as you feel appropriate. <laughs> oh, I, I, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if you're, if you're a manufacturer of, and you don't have Class 3 products, um, uh, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> There's still a lot of work to do. Uh, if you have Class 3 products, you're kind of more of an, a, a fire mode. But... Um, um, you know, if you're a manufacturer of Class II products, you have to determine, first of all, whether you have any devices that are subject to what we call the, the FIDASIA timeline, so the FDA Safety and Innovations Act, uh, a, a law passed in 2012, added a new requirement to UDI, so there are cla so Class II, if FDA considers the device, a Class II implant or life-sustaining, life-supporting device, then you're actually subject in, in a year and change from now, September 24th of 2015. Uh, there is a list of those devices by product code on FDA's website. 
Uh, so I would start there, understand um, what your, uh, as Becky said, understand your, your product portfolio. Um, it, you know, what, is anything due in 2015? What's due in 2016? Um, and then really start to understand what kind of changes you need to make. Uh, a lot of this is, as Becky mentioned, strategic at first. Um, you know, are you putting barcodes on now? Are they correct? What kind of changes do you need to make? Um, you know, all of the, the labeling and validation activities that go on there. Um, and at the same time, you know, though I do describe them as work stream one and two, I, I would, they're not sequential. <laughs> uh, they really are parallel work streams. Um, at the same time, really starting to understand, as I said, that the, the database creation of the, the data for submission is, is the, the harder task here. Um, so really start that process. Um, you can use as a template uh, the spreadsheet that FDA makes available. Uh, again, what used to be Appendix B. Uh, it's a good starting point to understand the attributes that you need to collect, um, what they need to look like, what their formats are, and really start that process of, of, of what we call master data management. Um, and again, it's something that we're, we're happy to help you with. We've been helping clients with for some time now. Thank you, Jay. Uh, there's a follow-on question from Pamela in regards to uploading files into the Good ID. Uh, she'd like to know, can they do mass uploads of Class II devices once the data is complete in Excel? Well, um, I'm going to divide this up into two questions. Um, the first is the sort of a mass upload notion. Um, SPL is actually an individual record, um, and FDA we made this decision um, that each record that each record would be one DI record submission. Um, you can submit a thousand, ten thousand records, send them through one at a time. Do 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 do. They fly right through the ESG. Uh, but it, 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 they get submitted and processed one at a time. And the reason for that is that if you, organ or if you, if you combine thousands of records into one meta record and submit that, and only one element of one record is bad, then the whole thing is bad. So either it all works or it all doesn't work. And that's very difficult uh, to try to troubleshoot. So um, each record is submitted. Each DI record is an individual record and submitted one at a time and, and processed one at a time. But you can submit them many, 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 you know, one after another. There's not kind of a hit the button, wait, hit the button, wait kind of thing. It sends them through, uh, you know, it sends through 10 or 15 or 20,000, whatever you need to do. Um, the part that threw me a bit was the Excel bit. Um, again, FDA doesn't have. Uh, a spreadsheet upload, uh, the good ID doesn't have a spreadsheet upload capability. Um, and again, that, that decision was made because there can be multiple values for any given uh, cell, uh, if you will, in, in an in a Excel spreadsheet, and that's, you can't do that. Um, so there are, some of our partners do have Excel spreadsheet upload capabilities, it doesn't put it right into the database, it puts it into a staging area there where you then go in and manage the information once it's been uploaded. So um, again, the Excel spreadsheet is a good place to start, recognizing that, that the data probably needs uh, further uh, manipulation um, you know, past how it's presented in, in the spreadsheet. And that's the purpose of, of those tools that some of our partners make available. Thank you, Jay. So um, the gentleman asking the question about the uh, Class II device and what should we do now to start to get ready, uh, add-on statement is it's not life-sustaining or supporting. Okay. Not life-sustaining slash supporting, if that helps at all to add further. Right. Well, so you've got, um, you know, you've, so you're not in, 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 in you've got some time. Um, you know, you've got till September 24th of 2016. Uh, for to get those class three products compliant, um, so you know you have the opportunity to to do this maybe in a, in a more <laughs> reasoned fashion. Uh, but I would again, as Becky mentioned, encourage you to start uh, understanding what needs to be done. You know how many products, how many product lines, where are the manufacturing sites, how are they marked now, um, what changes need to occur. Uh, you may not even if you're marking 
products at particular levels now. You may need to mark them at, at lower levels than you currently do. Um, so really understanding how the products are, are currently packaged and labeled, what changes need to be made. Um, most manufacturers, even if they're putting barcodes, I, I use that term loosely, on products, they're, they're likely, um, I found many of them are not correctly formatted. Many manufacturers are not verifying. You really need to verify, um, not just check to see that it has, but actually have verifiers or verification plans in place uh, to verify barcodes. And then, of course, there's all the, the data collection activities that need to take place. So um, you know, I, I would encourage you to start now to understand all that and, and recognize that you have um, you can do this in a reasoned way and not try to uh, really kind of chaotically put this in place. Um, I don't. I mean, I don't. I don't mean this to be pejorative, but you know, we have a number of clients who are really rushing and struggling, um, really rushing and struggling to meet class three compliance. So you know, it is something that takes time, uh, particularly if you've got you know any number of products. If you've got you know, hundreds or, or thousands of SKUs or, or even tens of thousands of SKUs. This is something that takes time. you really got to go through each of these things one at a time and understand what's going on. So um, you also need to take into account, I didn't even touch on because we're not really talking about the whole work stream, but you need to understand what's going on globally. You know, you need to understand where your products are being distributed and what's going on in other countries. Um, I, I found also that manufacturers are using this opportunity uh, to revisit the way that labeling and labels are created, modified, managed by the organization. Often it's kind of been, been something that's spun together over time. Um, and, and often other changes are being made to the label at the same time, um, you know, whether it's a rebranding thing or, or changes of address or what have you. So you know, it, there's, there's a lot of moving parts and pieces. And I encourage you to just start at least understanding what the four corners of the project uh, will look like. Thank you, Jay. So David is asking, if we have private label customers whose information, GS1 prefix product code is on the label slash barcode, who is considered the labeler? Um, yeah, that's, it's a great topic and one that I, I covered in, in the previous webinar. Um, the the short answer is it it doesn't matter. Um, the la the labeler is a regulatory concept, um, and it, it's it, it was meant to differentiate uh, or create a differentiation between uh, how FDA uh, manages regulated entities, and and by that I mean that it, we typically talk about device manufacturers. Um, but if you look, you'll see that uh, a manufacturer, uh, from FDA's perspective, it, it covers a, a wide array of, of actors. And so an importer, a contract sterilizer, a specification developer, these people are all manufacturers from FDA's perspective. And so the, the creation of this regulatory concept of labeler uh, was meant to, to limit the world, because if we said the manufacturer was responsible for UDI, it was like, well, everyone. So, um, so essentially, somebody has to be responsible uh, uh, for the two work streams, if you will. Uh, so, you know, someone's uh, you mentioned G10. So, someone's G10, someone's barcode has to be on the product, and someone has to submit data to the database. Um, in what you described, uh, you are private label manufacturing for some other organization and you're putting their name and, and, and appropriately their G10 on the product, that's fine. Um, they are, uh, in terms of um, data barcode, UDI application, they are the label of the product um, because it's their barcode. Um, but either one of you, and, but more likely them, uh, would be responsible for submission of the data to the database. Again, it doesn't one doesn't necessarily follow from the other. Uh, you know, you could have split responsibilities, but but essentially it means somebody is ultimately responsible uh, for for UDI assignment, application, and database submissions. 
Thank you, Jay. Heather is asking, uh, do you have a list of GDSN providers that have successfully submitted data to the Good ID? Um, we could provide that to you, yes. Very good. Uh, we'll connect after the call, Heather, and we'll see what we can do for you there. Okay, question from Catherine. If we have a device that may be repaired and have sellable parts for repair or exchange, must each SKU or components um, or the parts need to get UDI and be uploaded in the Good ID? Um, I uh, probably not, but I would need to have a lot more information. Um, it, the, the, the trigger uh, for UDI, as it is for, for many FDA-regulated uh, activities, is around commercial distribution. Um, so if you are putting a device, a device accessory, a device part uh, into commercial distribution, then it needs to meet UDI. Um, if you're not, if you've got internally parts that you are that you have and something comes in and they're service parts or repair parts that you're just doing something to a device internally, uh, you know, the, those things don't go into commercial distribution, then, then you do not need to, uh, you may, but you do not need to assign UDIs or, or upload data. Very good. And uh, an additional question from Catherine. Um, if we use the web interface to submit records manual, uh, manually, excuse me, and we have a device with several sizes. So many of the fields are identical. Can we copy and paste to facilitate the data entry? There is, uh, yes. It, it's a great question. Um, and again, I just didn't cover it in the short time I had. Um, we could we could have a eight-hour webinar on the database. Um, <laughs> but there is a copy function. Once you have uh, passed the business rules, uh, so you've, re you've reviewed the record and it's passed the business rules, uh, you can then copy the record and it copies everything over except for the uh, primary device identifier. Uh, so if you have multiple sizes of a record, uh, multiple sizes of a device, you create one record and then you can copy and change um, you know, the, the, the applicable information throughout. So yeah, that was a feature that we built into the database. Um, I also want it, that also raised uh, in my mind because I thought the question was going in a different direction. Uh, just so that you know, um, you can. There are some subtleties, but generally speaking, um, you can operate both in the web interface space and the SPL submission space at the same time. So you can. Uh, we have some clients who are, for example, uh, manually entering uh, data for their Class Three products. Uh, because they have a relatively small number, um, and then as they move into class two, either Fidesia or class two non-Fidesia, or into class one, uh, they're looking, because there are many, many more, they have thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of SKUs, uh, they're looking for a systemic solution, so they're, you know, they're going to submit electronically. Uh, so they're doing manual now, and they'll do electronic in the future. And you can continue largely, again, there are subtleties, but largely to do that. So even if you're doing manual now, uh, you can always switch in the future to an electronic submission solution, and that's, that's fine. Very good. And I think with that, we had better uh, wind down the session here. We have approached the hour. And I uh, appreciate everybody hanging in there. And, and I agree with Jay. We could just keep going for hours and hours here. But um, we'll continue in the uh, next session then. I appreciate everybody taking the time uh, to uh, join us for the information sharing session here. And I would encourage you all to visit the USDM website, which is, of course, usdm.com. You can find more information there around upcoming webinar events as well as the recorded sessions of the previously presented topics. If there's something you'd like to see us discuss, uh, specific pain points or anything we can address for you to help you down the path to compliance, let us know that. We're open to your feedback. We like to make sure that uh, the sessions are a good use of your time and the information we're presenting is useful for you. Um, we do invite you to join uh, the USDM group on LinkedIn. There's a uh, question and answer forum out there as well. And as 
I mentioned, let us know we're on the right track. We do appreciate your feedback and redirection if necessary. Thank you, Jay, so much for presenting a solid and much needed information. And uh, appreciate the opportunity to team with you all in working towards excellence and compliance. Enjoy the rest of the day.